about the speaker a little bit. Greater New Jersey chapter and the BOD or board member, Jay Nierberg, he's a management consultant with Accenture Strategy. He's had basically senior supply chain positions with Warner Lambert and other consumer health organizations. He's pioneered collaborative forecasting and replenishment, CFAR initiative, as part of the retail working group with Walmart, JDA, Manulogistics, SAP, and benchmarking partners. He holds degrees in industrial engineering, an MBA from RPI, he's a certified supply chain professional, a Six Sigma Green Belt, wow, he's got a lot of activities, <laughs> <laughs> and a certified professional forecaster. So without any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Jay Nierberg, tonight's speaker. So, um, what we're going to talk about is supply chain 2.0, and this, this is really where supply chain is going. Um, and so, one of the questions is like, why should you care? What, is this, what does this mean for me? You know, why should I be interested? Right? So, first thing you should be aware of is, um, my company you know, does consulting with about 80% of Fortune 500 companies. So we're in dialogues with a lot of executives, chief operating officers, supply chain executives. And they're asking us, they're saying, you know, where is supply chain going? How do I prepare my organization? What do I need to be thinking about? So I think at one level, it's <coughs> interesting to know what a lot of the executives are, are thinking and asking questions about. Um, if you just step back and look at the whole environment, what, what is the business environment today? If I was to try and characterize it, I would say, Growth is kind of weak, right? You're not seeing a lot of growth. People are struggling for growth. Costs keep going up, They're struggling against costs. And I think, interestingly, capital investment, we're not seeing a lot of it. So investments in systems, investments in new plant and equipment, they're really not keeping up. And it's part of, you know, for public companies especially, they're trying to give the money back to shareholders, you know, dividends, so maybe you're on the receiving end of that. But we're just not seeing the investment where we need it to be. On a more personal level, for your career, and thinking about where you are in the supply chain, I think it's important to understand where the trend's going, where, and for myself, where should I develop myself? How do I differentiate myself? And I know I was talking to some of the students, it's great to, to talk to you. Where, how do I differentiate myself going forward? So I think it's important to think about these things. Another is for a lot of the companies, and I, you know, just speaking to, to folks today, you look at you know, the different companies. Are they keeping up? So I think to look at some of the framework that we talk about here, as you have sessions with your leadership, um, you can ask them, you know, what are we doing about, you know, I notice our competitor is doing such and such. What are we doing about this particular situation? And if they're not, which I've seen before, then what should I be watching for and doing? Does it mean that we're going to lose our competitive uh, holding in, in the marketplace? So sometimes those are signs or early warning indicators that competitively you might have a, a challenge. And then the last thing is probably a little bit more personal, but when we talk about some of these trends, do they excite you? Um, how, ma how many of you have taken the Straits Finder? I, I don't know if you've, your companies have it, uh, Gallup Straits Finder. So for me personally, I show up as a futurist. So I'm, more, I'm as comfortable with thinking about the way things are going to be. I can almost see it is what happens with me. I can lay it out. And then I can work to make it happen kind of thing. Um, and so I have a passion about some of these trends. And in fact, for me personally, on you know, one of these trends, I just decided to move into it um, because it excited me so much. So you may learn something more about an area and decide that you know, it's for you and you want, it, you want to jump into it. 
So um, I'm just going to touch base on some of the, the high-level trends. You know, the, the, the basic definition of supply chain is rights, right? Right product, right place, you know, right time, right price, right? That's all the basic stuff. But it's really, it's really tremendously complicated, and it's continuing to be so. I know I see it. And so if I were to talk about maybe five key trends that, that really make the world a, a really difficult place to manage from a supply chain perspective. You know, globalization and even tailoring to various cultures uh, is a big trend. The volatility in the marketplace. So, you know, here we're talking about competition, regulatory requirements, geopolitical factors. So I was just thinking about an example. You know, just the price of oil, right? High, then it's low. And you know, you're thinking about what's you know all the the oil recovery and in the Bakken and and all of that, and then all of a sudden the price drops and bingo, it's all quiet. But there was a real boom going on when the price was high. Digital technology, well, it's it's moving the cloud based. We are talking to many many companies, and after many cycles of implementing very complex software, it's moving to the cloud. Maybe a little bit slow, but it is moving there. And so those convulsive major implementations that shave years off your life are you know, probably on, on the way out. It also means a lot less capital investment, maybe more investment on a monthly basis to rent, you know, to rent the software in the cloud. But, you know, the in-memory piece is happening, that the calculations are, are going quickly. And then also, we were just talking at the table about social media. And I think, um, Karen, you were also talking about social media. So, the struggle in supply chain is how do you translate those social media signals into demand signals? And what's going on in that space? I can't tell you how many conversations I have had. And I know I personally worked on one. I was I was actually in a, in a demand planning position when a very well-known company had a major brand that mothers loved and trusted, all of a sudden um, had a major difficulty, a major recall, and how do you respond to that you know, kind of thing. And I picked it up from the social media. And the way I picked it up was the mothers were so angry. I, I, I was absolutely floored at what anger I saw coming out of this. I didn't have numbers. I couldn't quantify it. I couldn't see how many of them, but the, the just sheer anger that was coming out, I went to leadership and said, we have an opportunity here. I don't know what, how it's going to translate in terms of POS takeaway, but something's going to happen here. So social media is definitely uh, a big thing. The expanding data, we're all familiar with it, you know, exponentially increasing data. So you're getting it from your trading partners. Also the, you know, we, I try not to use too many buzzwords, but IoT, the Internet of Things. So as you think about track and trace in the pharma industry, and you think about RFID, um, and even just tracking shipments. I mean, it's just amazing the amount of data that's there. And then lastly, customer. <coughs> customer expectations. So buying the buying experience, personalized products, you know, having your M&Ms with your initial on it and your favorite color. Um, you know, the, the multi-channel experience, so online. So buy it, collect it, and return it anywhere. It's got to be pretty much streamlined. And I know I'm, a, and I'm Amazon Prime uh, fan and, and have been so. And every time I see a U.S. Postal Service truck on Sunday, I'm basically saying to myself, I think that Amazon is keeping U.S. Postal Service afloat. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it seems like that. So um, let me bring this into um, the supply chain. Um, and, and some of the challenges we're seeing in supply chain. So this is some of the dialogue that we, we see on a regular basis from a lot, of, um, a, a lot of folks that we talk to. So the first one is, is poor response time. Um, 
And this is like, for instance, I worked with a client last year, an electronics manufacturer, and they were just so slow in terms of responding to the demand, their cycle, and again, not being flexible and agile. Um, so, you know, operating model, models, organizational li uh, layouts, uh, align functions that, that are silos, essentially. So the decision making becomes very linear. And I know in doing many, um, you know, SNLP processes, I used to run the monthly process. Um, it's very, very linear in terms of how it works because that's how the systems and the, and the jobs are, are set up. Um, but the information gets to be out of date and length, lengthens the supply chain response time. So there is an increasing appetite to get a lot more agile and quick. Uh, lack of visibility is another one, uh, another challenge. And so the, the current technology limits the ability to have end-to-end -end visibility at the order, product, and shipment level. And so that's a big challenge. So this results in higher fulfillment costs, a lot of expedited shipments, and a lot of inaccurate plans. You know, you hear about you know, forecasts that are not accurate, and the inability to sense problems as they arise. So we're seeing a lot of that. Conflicting priorities. How many within your own you know, supply chain and logistics organization have conflicting priorities? Do you, can I see some hands? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I know one, one organization I was with, um, the manufacturing side was looking at inventory while on the commercial side it was all about customer service. And it was always like this, instead of sharing the metrics and, have, and looking at them more holistically. Um, so there's, there's a lot of opportunity there and that and that. Um, inefficient fulfillment model. So, um, so this is really almost about the new omnichannel e-commerce world. So traditional distribution and transportation models were created to support high volumes and few SKUs. Where's the world going? Uh, the world is going to customize order, much wider product assortment, mm -hmm. and you know multiple, you know like the last mile delivery kind of thing too. You know the drones, right? Two hour, you want two hour delivery. You know, I was walking in Manhattan, I'm going past a garage, and I see the uh, the Amazon lockers in there. Um, you know, the expectations are getting there. Two hour delivery, I want it, you know, give, give it to me. Um, the last one, uh, let's see, so inflexible technology. So this is getting back to costly to deploy and inflexible systems that um, don't really scale up either. And then the last piece is kind of the talent piece, which is really a lack of advanced cross-functional skills. So I know we typically think about specializing, and we've been brought up that way. I've certainly been brought up that way. I'm a demand planner. I'm a production planner. I'm a supply planner. But we're talking to a lot of companies about an organizational mm -hmm. shift. And so I'll talk more a little bit more about that. But the, the ability to understand end-to-end -end dependencies and the associated financial impacts and operational impacts across functions are really what businesses are looking for. And so we're getting into a lot more of that. So I'll, I'll drill into that. And I don't know if there are others that I'm missing here, but you know, when we talk about you know, a lot of the issues, I just wanted to summarize them. I mean, if you think there are some, does anybody, are there others that come to mind in terms of some major challenges? I'm sure anything that does kind of can fall into one of them. Yeah, yeah, I think we, Jay, we see that. Yeah. The other thing is the, the soft skills. Yes. The communication, the soft skills, those yes. are the critical. Right? Yes, as Karen was mentioning, um, I'll talk a little bit about the organizational piece of this because um, what we're, you know, we, we've grown up, and I certainly have through most of my career, demand planners, supply planners, um, and production planners being separate functions. I'll, I'll 
go into it a little bit later, we're seeing the emergence of network, network planners that transcend above demand and supply, okay? And that's enabled by some of the technology that's available. And they need to have the skills, the soft skills, the influencing skills to look at scenarios and to decide on the best one for the company that may be financial and operational rather than optimizing a particular function. And that's, that's different, but it's getting a lot of attention. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So what does this mean? Uh, this means today's supply chains seem to be like analog machines trying to solve problems in the digital world. And you know, the, exchange, the extent of the change, at least that we're seeing, uh, to operate in a new world requires more than a minor, up, uh, minor upgrade. Uh, so we're, what we're saying is if you're looking to just tweak your model, uh, you're running a huge risk with this. Um, and so uh, I, I think that's one of the key messages. And then those that are able to adapt and enhance their capabilities and meet those new demands and challenges are going to benefit. So you know, I, I think about an Amazon, I have some Amazon examples. If the, if the technology will support us. So what do we mean by supply chain 2.0? I'm mean, kind of using that term. But it's ultimately to create you know, your vision and, and your company of the next generation of supply chain that drives the company's future. I mean, that, that's what it is. So how do you get there? Um, so if I was to summarize this, I would say it's breaking down the functional silos. So that means and it has to do with the soft skills, and it has to do with understanding not just your silo, but across the whole organization, what it takes, and, and the metrics associated with that. So maybe redefining priorities and grouping those priorities, and building synchronized planning and fulfillment capabilities, so everybody on the same page to execute that. So the key characteristics are that when, when we we're talking to, to companies, they're all looking to be much more rapid and flexible and agile and dynamic. They're all struggling with how long it takes to shift. And a lot has to do with even the technology, again, being very sequential and linear. Uh, it needs to be scalable so that if you put something in, you, you will acquire a company or divest it that you can easily handle it. Um, that's just the nature of business today. They want to know if this division or this product line doesn't fit anymore. I can alter my structure and still carry on with it and it's not life changing. Intelligent, so you know we'll talk more about this. Using Internet of Things and sensing further down the supply chain to be able to really manage the new environment and then connect it. So that has to do with the portability of things but also uh, <coughs> sensors all through the supply chain and being able to be connected from the supplier all you know to the consumer and, and back again. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some of the building blocks. Um, and so this is where I'll, I'll drill into a little bit more of, of what this is. So these are six core building blocks. So these are the areas that that we feel um, need to be thought about and invested in, you know, if your companies are going to advance into the next, into the next wave. Um, so, let's, we'll talk about integrated operating model, breaking the silos and, and um, providing connectivity. So that's about enabling visibility and planning and execution capability from across the end-to-end -end supply chain. And then business processes that span the functional silos. And so this is where I was talking about the, the network planner. This is where a cross-functional network planner with end-to-end -end visibility and overall responsibility for supply chain performance. And so one of the ways that that is happening is the software and technology tools are enabling to see demand and supply and capacity all in one database in the cloud. So that's what's transitioning these roles. So instead of being sequential, now you have one database in the cloud of demand and supply 
um, and also the, the scheduling. And you're also optimizing inventory, by the way, in this. So that's some of the new, the new activity that, that's, that, that's happening. Um, Consumer-driven, customer-driven supply chains. So that's using the real-time data from the Internet of Things, and of course, the social media impacts. So even the idea of a flash sale, for example, on the Internet, what is it going to do to your supply chain? Um, so the connection there, how does that work? What's, what's the impact? So these, these types of things drive the need for what-if analysis and a lot more scenario modeling than we've, we've ever had. And this is what a lot of the senior people now are beginning to understand. So in my early days in the career, it was a lot more executionally oriented, and I always saw the need for what-if <coughs> analysis. And I can remember, I, I worked with Joe in a, in a pharma company. I'll never forget this. We had a new product launch, and I wanted to model what if it grows at 10% and 25%. And we had SAP, and I just wanted to understand what its impact was going to be if it hit the 25% higher than expected you know, launch ability. And so what I wanted to do was just send those you know, forecasts all the way and understand the impact to the suppliers understand the impact to the, you know, the shifts in the plant. And IT, we sat with IT, we, you know, they, they understand what we wanted to do to try and model this. And they just said, you know, we can't do this. It's impossible. It'll take way too long. We, we really can't put it all together. So fast forward now. Now we can do those kinds of things. I am literally working with companies where just the smallest shift in the demand and you can see in less than a second what the impact is all the way through, uh, through your plant organizations, all the way through the supplier. So this is, not, this is now a, a available in the cloud, and, and it's pretty transformational. Um, performance management. So by that we mean uh, predictive analytics. I mentioned scenario modeling to, to uh, drive decision making. Um, and then also the combination of business and financial metrics to drive the supply chain processes. So even in, for those of you who are familiar with sales and operations planning, you know, the monthly cycle, we're looking more at metrics that look at margin, revenue, <coughs> inventory, and then looking at the scenarios and what those impacts are, looking at the whole environment. And we may even want to weight those individual uh, metrics to understand when doing a scenario. Uh, Jim? How come you don't have a metric, I mean, performance management for uh, customer service? Is well, that a big part, you know, line and fill array or? Yeah, I mean, we still or, feel that those are important, um, but I think at a more, and the, yes, we still feel that um, all the individual, <coughs> you know, functional measurements are absolutely critical. Um, so yeah, customer service, always important, <coughs> inventory, always important, forecast accuracy, uh, you, know, order you know, order management, but in, a, in an SNLP monthly uh, process, um, also mar looking at margin when making decisions um, are, are, are what we're coaching a lot of companies to do. Um, along with inventory impacts and, and those kinds of things. So it's more, more of a holistic business picture. Um, and again, now is better than when I was doing it because we never did a lot of the financial uh, analysis, but, but the leaders are, are definitely doing that. So that's what we mean by performance management and also the, the scenario modeling because what's the impact? If the forecast is 5% higher than expected, 10%, can I handle it? And now executives are asking more questions. Hey, if it takes off better than we expect for this new launch, can we, can we deliver it? Can Treasury handle it? Because it's talking Yeah, it's also the investment that's needed. And is there a capital implication? as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, definitely. These are all, all scenarios that 10 years ago were really never thought that much about that we're getting a lot more interest in saying, what's the impact of these launches 
Is it going to affect my infrastructure? And you can model that. And we're helping companies do that. Okay. Yes? In terms of performance management, though, and everything that you've been discussing, I think one of the challenges that maybe also still needs to be worked on is risk management. Because that's something that really has fallen yes. hugely by the wayside. Because whereas we can mm -hmm. figure out what a 5% or 10% increase, decrease will yes. do, we still can't figure out what will happen if uh, you know Hiroshima happens and we don't right. have another supplier lined up. Right. You know that kind of stuff. Still Actually, exist. yeah, that's a great point, and I, it is one of the. In fact, it's it's right here. And we're we're doing a tremendous amount. We're talking to a lot of folks about this too, and it's absolutely critical. Uh, we were just we were we were talking about hedging with the uh, shipments. At the worst time of the year, right? When holiday shipments. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, and and all of a sudden, you know, companies are going to have to do a lot more airlifting than they expected. So you have to, you know, understand what are where are my risks? Do the modeling and then build the mitigation plan. Um, Rita and I work for a company where we the the main product stopped being manufactured, and what. You know, you can't, and all of a sudden our sales were, were, were cut in almost half. And you really need to do, for the benefit of shareholders, if it's a public company, you need to be able to respond to that. So that's a great, that's a great point. You know, as you look at, you know, levels, you know, sort of a, a, a generic operating model, you kind of need the visibility to see the dashboards and alarms setting off. You need that layer. But then you need this layer, you know, the root cause analysis. Joe, you and I used to do root cause analysis all the time, but it was all manual. Here's where we're talking about simulations and what if you know, important. And, and as you mentioned, the risk. What has happened? What's our potential? And what could happen? And how do we respond uh, with a, mis a risk mitigation plan um, to do that? So that, that's all part of being re responding more rapidly. <coughs> and then, you know, there's a whole process of execution piece in terms of monitoring that. So that's a framework that we talked to a lot of folks about because I, I worked with a major uh, Fortune 10 company this past year and they were spending a lot of money. And they said, what should we stop doing and what should we start to do? And we started to talk to them about some of the things here that they just hadn't been doing. Um, so there's a lot of focus on ERP these days, but what we were kind of counseling them, you know, that's the base core, you know, basic master data. And they wanted to standardize it around the world. But when we asked, what's your return on investment in doing that, they couldn't quantify it. So we said, well, why don't you stretch that out? There's nothing wrong with standardizing. It'll eventually make you more efficient. But you're not going to get a big return on investment from, from doing that. It's a good idea, but it's not as more as impactful for shareholders as some other ideas. But, but thank you. Risk management is a really, really, really hot topic. Um, so if the, uh, let's see if the technology gods will be with us here. So one of the things, again, there's a lot of activity going on here with all this chatter. Um, there's some interesting companies doing some stuff. I know my company is trying to acquire some of them. And again, it's the linkage between social media and the chatter and the buzz. Is it positive or negative? And then what is it doing to demand signals? I mean, there's a lot of action going on here. I can tell you that. Also. Again, it's Internet of Things, telemetry. So port delays. You know, think about a, a cockpit where um, you know you, you're seeing red where there's a delay that you know is beyond a certain threshold. Maybe it's two weeks caught in the port and it starts to flash red on your on your um, you know your, your dashboard, um, and then maybe you have to think about some some <coughs> other. Um, risk mitigating ways to handle it if it's caught up. You know, how do you, how do you get, get around that? Um, so the data to drive analytics, um, you know, the, the drive for analytics to predict trends and patterns. 
Um, you know, it also will offer insights into trade promotion effectiveness. New product launches is on everybody's mind, and also end of life decisions and how to drive them. That, that's that's important. Um, so there's really some interesting things going on. Let's see if this will work. Um, and, and if if uh, if you can hear this. My theme. You probably all heard of this. things, but, um, you know, uh, so I have a few other, um, few other ones. I'm not going to play this all that long, but <clears throat> some of this is just interesting to get your mind thinking about some different kinds of things. So, um, and I apologize, some of these may have some commercials. Um, some of these may have commercials, so if I can, if I see I can skip this. Let me skip the ad. What if a retailer could tell how a shopper really feels about a dress on some All right. sale at their store just by the look on their face? Mm -hmm. That may not quite be science fiction. Companies are already immensely and analyzing thousands of bits of data from software enabled cameras that can detect emotions on people's faces. <laughs> this whole thing but you get the idea there's a lot more research going on at the point of consumption about what is really going on I, I just find uh, and I'm not in you know endorsing any of this or but I just wanted to have some examples of how you know people are reading uh, trying to read patterns at the point you know at the point of consumption and understand what's going on um, so one of the big concepts that we're talking to a lot of companies about, and I know I was involved with the Center of Excellence um, myself in one of my roles, but a lot of a lot of discussion in supply chain around integrated control towers. So I don't I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. It's certainly evolving. It's certainly young, um, but we're talking to a lot of companies about this. So it's really a, having. Um, an integrated, even integrated planning and fulfillment control towers. So, you know, when I was talking before about migrating to a, even a network planner type of role, that's where you're looking at demand and supply and making the trade-off decisions in, in real time using some of these. So, it's really about visibility, planning, and execution. Um, and you know, those are the kind of the three layers across the supply chain. This is all nice, nice stuff. But basically, you're trying to look across the silos for enhanced collaboration. So back to Gary's point, 
You want to enhance the collaboration by having more visibility, demand, supply, suppliers, and your customers, of course. Okay. Um, so and this may be uh, this may be a little short video if it if it works. Um, but you get I think it, at the end of it you get the idea that. It's, So this is a production control tower. Yes. required clear visibility regarding what's going on around them, the status of their plane, other air traffic, and conditions on the ground. Their lifeline is the control tower, directing their approach, confirming their instruments are correct, and assuring the plane is on the right path. a production control system that takes real-time information from the factory floor and accurately directs that information throughout its internal operations and external supply chain operations to provide visibility that maximizes quality <laughs> and productivity. How do you coordinate all that information to make sure you're landing safely? You need a so, control tower. So this is just, I, I'm not even familiar with this. Tower. I'm not even uh, familiar with this, this company exactly, but you get the idea that people are sitting where the data is coming in and they can make some of the trade-off decisions. So um, there's a lot more activity in, the, in this, this area. It, it is very different. Um, I think we kind of went through that, uh, this chart before, but you know, again, there's this control tower off to the side here. So there's the ability to do demand planning and supply planning, customer service and order management. Uh, you're looking at the process and your analytics, so the, the analytics group is coupled with this. And there's also the ability to see deployment and transportation. Now, the thing with it is this. Visualize you're in a war room. Because you know, we're talking about a control tower. We're talking about visibility across demand, <coughs> supply, uh, transportation. And you've got all the functions in your room, and you're making a decision right then and there. So I know I was involved how many years in my career of a monthly SNLP cycle. What we're talking to companies about now is continuous SNLP. So what does that mean? If you have, a, you have this information, demand, supply, and capacity information in one database, and you can make those trade-offs, you can make the decisions in within you know minutes or a second and just get the approval on it once you go through you know how you arrived at it. But it's the idea of getting the functions in the same room together, which is a little different. Again, I've been so many years, it was demand planners on one side, they never get the forecast right, they throw it over the wall to the supply planners. And I know when I was in demand planning, I used to say to the supply planners, Tell us whether you can make the forecast, yes or no. And it would take two weeks to do that. And that, that's not cutting it anymore, is, is, is part of the message here. But again, you know, there's a couple of different layers here. The visibility layer, the analytics layer, and then the execution layer. Um, and those are needed in today's environment, so that, that's where it needs to go, you know, with that visibility of cost planning and fulfillment. So, yeah, so this main, you know, a, a new set of processes would need to be created. But again, it's looking at the whole thing and then, you know, trying to, to capture that. Um, this is about the organization, again, about the soft skills. So, you know, to align all levels within the organization, what we're talking about is a more streamlined view, different than demand planners, supply planners. Um, you know, so a network planner has the ultimate responsibility for supply chain performance, okay? How's that different than a lot of companies are calling a supply chain planner? How would you differentiate that? Um, good question, because I don't, I don't know all of the, uh, you know, what, what is necessarily meant by a supply chain planner, but in this case, 
it's really all encompassing and end to end. So the collaboration with vendors and customers, so end to end suppliers, raw material, and customers, um, bringing together the collaboration. Um, so it would be supply, you know, demand planning, supply planning, probably working with salespeople, customers, and suppliers. So it's a level, it's a lot higher. So it's not, it's not the specialization. It's even different than our, you know, this, this is where I could see Apex going down the road. It, it's something more along those lines. So network planning to the head of the supply chain working with the C-suite. So again, looking at options, you know, do we import from other countries? Do we do we shift inventory around? What are our various options for satisfying uh, for satisfying customers? Um, and more of the function. We're not saying demand planners or, or supply planners or production planners go away, but we be more focused on generating output, uh, which is used to drive the end-to-end -end process. Hey, Jay, what's chief? Uh, Chief Suite, Chief Executive Officer, Chief Operating Officer, Chief Financial Officer. Thank you, thank you. Um, so that's what we're, we're talking. So in another way of saying it, supply chain planning organizations uh, could be more streamlined in the, in the future because of the having the visibility. Uh, you know, we talked about performance management, but really it's <coughs> uh, to drill into a little bit more predictive scenario modeling. Um, so the metrics, number one, metrics are realigned that approach that supports overall business objectives for profitability, you know, margin, revenue, uh, inventory, even cash flow, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and then, so end-to-end -end supply chain metrics. So you still need the functional ones. Um, so each functional area contrib contributes, but end-to-end -end activities were truly really measured at the end of the day. Uh, and you still need these, the functional metrics, like we were saying with the gym. Uh, you know, demand planning, transportation management, forecast accuracy, asset utilization, all basic, you need them. Uh, so, um, there's probably a good um, optimization somewhere. It's part of that. It's the next level beyond Yes. What do you do once you know the future? What yes. Do you do about it? Yeah. Well, that's it's part of looking at scenarios and deciding the best one. And then segmentation. Um, you know, this is a this is something that um, I think is important, but not necessarily addressed um, in the in the way that it necessarily needs to. Um, so let me see if I can give you some examples of that. Um, if I may. Um, the <coughs> so this is about segmentation across various lines. So it may be uh, customer profiles, B to B, B to C, distributor. It might be channel segmentation. It may be order patterns, uh, seasonal, not seasonal. So, you know those kinds of things, and other types of drivers, product type. Uh, value, shelf life, business strategy, margin contribution. There's all different ways to build products and analyze them. I mean, I used to just spend time with ABC analysis, but a lot of different ways. Growth potential, strategic importance. So these are different ways of grouping uh, uh, segments of customers and products. And that really is, a, is, is something we're working with companies to really focus in on. And they're going to be, you know, one of the things we're saying is there's smaller or increased number of segments. And again, customer personalized needs by channel service level, even within marketing areas. So we're seeing that go on. And then end-to-end um, -end collaboration. So, um, you know, this is, you know, today, when you have meetings, there may be emails and phone calls, and you're doing a lot of spreadsheets and PowerPoint, right? That's typically, but what we're seeing now, what we're experimenting with, are collaboration platforms. So even the president is collaborating with supply chain folks and can send even scenarios or some of the data. And the data is available, of course, on a on a tele, you know, on a, a 
uh, iPhone, iPad, that kind of thing. And reports and scenarios are shared, discussed, emailed. We're, we're, you know, we're seeing this and approved uh, for decision making right away. So once you go through the analysis on a certain situation, that happens. And then, um, you know, colleagues, stakeholders interact and share the information and, and uh, the real time quantitative data. So I, I, won't, I won't go through the, the videos here, but. Um, you know, it really needs to be end to end, but a lot quicker. And so on the digital side, you know, just we were saying, cloud-based, connected to devices, that kind of stuff, uh, plug and play. For the control tower we're talking about, real-time visibility, real-time planning, even automation of some of the processes. Um, that's the next wave also on a lot of the software we're starting to see. You can actually chain these together and starting to do that. Um, advanced analytics, scenario modeling to get at optimal solutions, and then the network planners executing integrated supply chain processes. And then there's another hot topic here that we're talking to executives about called cognitive computing. So this is this is machine learning. So um, I actually saw some saw some demos of this. This is pretty pretty wild. A uh, couple of professors from MIT are working on this. So it's uh, real-time exception management. You know, there's so many signals you get, but if you establish the right thresholds, you know, how do you do that? How do you get that? But then there's self-learning. So how do you take that learning and get better and better at what the exceptions are? Um, and so uh, there's a lot of work going on just in terms of grouping products and figuring out whether they have similar patterns or not. So there is self-learning going on. We're working with several uh, major companies on this. So they are investing in this. It's not so high in the sky. Um, and it's just to be more dynamic, flexible, and adaptive and not be so manual. So that's some of the, some of the tech so some, stuff. Some other, other exciting areas are what we call self-ads, which is self-diagnosis, self-learning your supply chain should adapt so well that it will repair itself if something should Yes, happen. yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah, so, um, you know, and again, digitally, it's collaborative, so important. You know, you get those soft skills and you get people in one country talking to another across regions. You know, the social platforms are very important for that. And it also has to be external too. So talking to your customers. And it's more than just emails. We're talking about some platforms to do that. Um, and then mobile, of course, so the ability for executives to actually see activity and get alerts and notifications you know, on the iPhone or the iPad sitting in the airport. Uh, so we do that. And of course, real-time data feeds are important. Um, and this is kind of a picture of the whole thing you know, with uh, a lot of this stuff, but prescriptive analytics, real-time visibility, memory, concurrent planning, so that's not this sort of silo thing. Sense and react to what's going on, so that's that sort of visibility layer. Uh, scenario model, and the, and the risk piece is, is included in that. And so, um, you know, the, the bottom line is that, you know, we, we see a lot of companies at the, at the crossroads. They really have not invested in their, their infrastructure. A lot of the software is actually pretty old and very sequential. And so we're saying, hey, it's time to make the investments, um, at least in, when it comes to IT investments, to really think about, you know, some of the more cloud-related types of things. Um, those six building blocks that we talked about are foundational components for more efficient and flexible supply chain. And you know, that's what we're talking about is helping companies really meet the competitive framework, you know, going forward. So, you know, the pace of change continues to accelerate. So you always have to be, you know, you really need to be thinking about this. The last piece is probably the most the most difficult, and that's the change management piece here. So, you know, it's 
how do you motivate people to shift and change when they built processes, invested in software, um, and how do they? How can they embrace, you know, IT programs as you know, trying to lay the groundwork for the future while you're keeping a business running? I mean, that's really a challenge today. It's so so dynamic. You, know, you may have software you implemented, then you go to something in the cloud. How do you make transitions like that? It's really a challenge. So it's exciting times, but I think a, a lot of this um, is. It's not that far off because we are, a lot of people are thinking about this. So, you know, I hope that at least some of this got you thinking a little bit. Some of it's fun, a little far out, but, um, you know, it may not be that, that far away at the pace of change that, that we're seeing. Um, now I think I'll take some questions and. Yes. Um, Jay, um, excellent presentation and. Uh, in my company, for example, we have a, dis a big disconnect between Salesforce and supply chain. And because, as you say, there's a, a downturn in sales, you know, sales is afraid to say, well, I think you got something's going to be on an uptick, because they're afraid if they say it, then it doesn't happen, and then we build it, you know, you know, they are taking all the risk. So in this type of scenario, with this new type of management style, how would that risk be shared between sales and supply chain and communication improve? That's a great question. So part of the, part of the, so one of the solutions or one of the things that is probably the hardest to implement is shared metrics. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> um, if you talk to like Gartner and so forth, it means that the executive team in particular shares maybe five metrics. Could be margin, revenue, you know, working capital, mm -hmm. share. I, I'm just making those up, but it's usually somewhat of that cast of characters. And so you may care, you know, as much together, you, you care together, you know, with the senior leadership team and it transcends down that you're looking at all of that. Because that's more outcome based than just my, my place you know, my particular function or optimizing my particular function. But not many companies do that. Yeah. Uh, well, that's, that's a problem that comes from day to day because I'll make yeah. the inventory analysis and say, based on the sales for holdings, if you want to do this, you're all six months inventory. Right. But the wisdom of the executive group is that I'm in supply chain, so I can't see margin. <clears throat> so then you got to send an email to the VP of sales and our customer service director. And three days later, you'll get an answer. Well, maybe, yeah, it makes sense to hold six mm -hmm. months worth of inventory because right. the margin is eighty percent. Because whereas when I do that, I make the decision. Myself. Yeah, I can show you a dashboard we use that looks at, you know, for different scenarios, what are the, you know, the cost, the cost differences, the inventory differences, even the order, uh, you know, the, the service level mm -hmm. differences. Because you don't want, you know, yes, you might maximize your, uh, your profitability, but have some really angry customers. So you've got to look at all of those in some mm -hmm. form of a, a trade-off. But that's what the leadership is paying you for. I mean, well, I didn't really say it, but trade-offs are not often, dis are not discussed, I think, often enough. Mm -hmm. But they really need to be looked at. And, you know, without the tools there, it's really difficult because everybody you know, is just trying to keep up. Uh, so it's a challenge, but your question. Is that why they don't discuss it? Because they don't know how to get the information? I think... The trade-offs. I mean. Yeah, I, I think it's been hard to get that information and have it in a platform that makes it easy to look at all of that. I don't think that's existed before, is my personal opinion. And then the, the willingness, even if they didn't have the technology to share the met, you know, share all of those five major you know, five or six metrics across the whole team and everybody everybody aligned instead of finding each other. Yeah, that might be. Yeah, if I can answer that, yeah. Sure. So the whole thing is the shared metrics is definitely one way to get some of those people in silos to come out Absolutely. and doing it. Uh, obviously the big the big um, pain point is getting the upper management to buy into like the upper sales director and, and what have you. Because once once you actually do that and you actually have some metrics with our sales force, 
supply chain and sales force, inventory, man inventory volume management inventory, um, inventory targets, and forecast accuracy. Because if you wanted to get these guys engaged, if put money in yeah, front of them. Put money in front of them. Put money in front of them. And they'll like compare dollars to dollars. Forecast accuracy is another good one. And I do remember having that conversation. I had Gartner call in, the Gartner analyst say, you know, the best, the very best in the supply chain have that as part of their SNLP mm -hmm. or their monthly, you know, sales and operations planning process to have those shared metrics. And they perform better as a team as well because we're all in it together. But there's so few companies that are really doing that. It's still surprising. Because you'd be surprised when you have a sales rep call and say, this customer doesn't really give me a forecast. I can't get a great number. So what, is, what can we do to make this work? Uh, to, to give, to provide a decent number. Because in, whereas if you didn't have, when they were not involved in that metric, it's care less. And they just said, no changes here. Uh, no changes on the forecast. This is what it is. And it just ran. So at least they're getting engaged and they mm -hmm. do come out. Right. What I mean, do we do about this? How do we approach it? You know? in, in, one, in the company that uh, Joe and I worked at, we put forecast accuracy metrics into the field. Um, it wasn't as stringent. It wasn't. It was more at a brand level as opposed to like even a skew level. But um, you know, I could put on my demand planning hat here. You know, what we used to see in the field force was lowballing. You know, or mm -hmm. you know, a bias, a bias to under forecast so you get a good bonus. Hey, I get it. I get it. Uh, but but if it creates angry customers, or somebody says I delivered that sales number at the very last day of the quarter, but you can't deliver the product, you know, then then we're definitely disconnected. So uh, so that that was that's really a, you know, that's been a tremendous challenge. Hey guys, we have room for uh, two more questions. Is uh, getting a decision tree model already in place so that way when you're coming up against these issues that are holding up for making a decision in your area, you're ready to put the uh, groundwork in. It takes a long time to do something like that, but you're able to then navigate through with confidence that you're making the right decision and that everybody had buy-in into it. And that helps get everybody out of their comfort zone to drive them to work together before you even get out there. We're trying to get marketing more involved. We've invited marketing to the day supply chain meeting that I actually chair. Because basically when the VP supply chain is not in the room, I run, I run the meeting for them. I'm saying, you know, so I'm kind of making the decisions when there's like a fight between operations, production, and custom service. And I'll say, well, this one, you guys got expedited this one, you know, it's not, it's not really a priority, there's like a, a conflict. But when it's something like that, I push it up to the VP of sales and my VP of ops, but sometimes it's the VP of sales, he just doesn't want to commit to something. And I think the problem is that our sales people was just spending too much time at home and not enough time at the, not at the customer. Thank you, Carol. I'm not saying in general, I know, I can see it in our own. But one of the things is, um, too, back to yeah. like, going back to the end of the supply chain, you know, back to detecting the demand where it begins. Mm -hmm. You know, how about getting, like I can envision a time of, mm -hmm. you know, when the shelf shifts, you're getting that signal mm -hmm. and you're getting a replenishment signal. Uh, that takes a lot of folks out of the equation. Mm -hmm. Where you might need, where you need to collaborate with sales is forward looking events, you know, promotions, things that go on where you know it's coming up and you need to plan for it and anticipate it but from a baseline perspective, if there's way to get demand from the source, POS. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, there's some interesting, you know, again, I, I watched some of these software companies. Uh, there is a company called Terra Technology that mm -hmm. does demand mm -hmm. sensing. That's another buzzword. I uh, did a project, a, a test with it uh, at one company I was at. So it's really just picking up sort of the baseline daily trends in the business. And they've combined it with a company that does POS <coughs> modeling and pickup. So that's another example of getting, you know, and I was showing like the, the demand sensing and also the, 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 the social chatter. How do you combine those together? Well, I think it's just not the basic stuff. It's like three months ago, I saw a customer and it was $50,000 yes. a month. It's taken eight. 
and I shoot an email to VP of, did we lose the business? Because the raw materials are got a two or three month wait on it before we campaign this. And I know ah, we won the business, we won the business, and all of a sudden, we're still not seeing any orders. One more question? Uh, Alan, welcome to uh, You mentioned resilient in your supply chain. How do you do that in, uh, in the world of 3 p.m. and 4 p.m.? That's tough. Where yeah. they tend to buy and sell, uh, sell it to those mortgage companies and buy and sell it to the mortgage. Yeah, it's, it's difficult because a lot of those companies are not on the leading edge of using sensors. but. The thing is that the cost curve for putting those sensors on is dropping, and it may at some point be a requirement for doing business. If you don't have it on your containers on the ocean, you know, a, sense, a sensor, I'm not doing business with you. It's as simple as that. Or, again, it's an opportunity for those, instead of, you know, if they become tech technically savvy and have those kinds of tracking mechanisms, that I can tap into. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with something like GT Nexus. Does that strike a bell? Um, so picture you're at, you can see a world, a picture of the world, and you know where all of your inventory is. Um, I wouldn't do business in today's environment. I wouldn't be doing business unless I could have that, that visibility and I could track it and understand exactly where it is and then make diversion decisions. I mean, that's another part of risk mitigation is that I could see a shipment that's going to, I don't know, Chicago, and I say, okay, I really need that in Jacksonville. And you on the fly, you make the decision using the control tower. So that's where it's kind of moving. Yeah, we use EDI. I mean, we can't have a supplier or a distributor without using the control tower. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.